And welcome back to the channel. And again, I'm joined by David Mull to my left. And Dow Bloma is Jim King. Two bass players from Edinburgh. And I'm going to ask some, some good questions, which I think they are prepared for, hopefully. <laughs> anyway, guys, first question. The first, so it's always left to the dealer, to those who play poker. So that, that would be Dave. <laughs> okay, Dave, right. So when you're working on new stuff for the band or even for your own use, do you think it's more important to try and learn note for note or try and interpret things in your own way? What do you think is more important to grow as a bass player? That's my question to you, buddy. Right, that's a very good question. Um, and it depends on the player. It depends on the player, the song, and a whole lot of factors. The most important thing, if you're going to play, you know, a song, whether it's an original, we talk about covers, because, you know, mainly it's people learning covers, um, is to get, make sure that the rhythm is right. That's our first and foremost, our job is rhythm. So make sure you get the, you know, the accents where they're supposed to be, the chord changes, and, and basically lay out the music as people expect to see. Um, and then, yeah, it's, you know, if it's a bass line, obviously, that's got a very, very, you know, um, well-known, the bass is a well-known part. Say, for example, you know, um, we've got to get out of this place with animals. It's a bass riff. You can't get away with playing anything else. You have to get that nailed. Um, and whenever possible, yeah, I mean, the, the bass player that played it, or the composer that wrote the bass part, they'd written it for a reason, because it fits the song, it fits the rhythm, it fits the chord changes, or it supports the melody. Um, so if at all possible, yeah, but, you know, if I'm playing a Stevie Wonder song, you know, I'm, I'm no, I can't remember his name is bass player now, but I'm not that good. So, you know, why would I try, you know, it'd be impossible for me to play note for note. So an approximation, I know how I play, I know where my skills are. So what are the major parts? You know, is it, you know, is it, um, is it an Octavius play, you can play that, etc. There's a little run, and you think, well, that's a bit too much for me. Just even play half the notes, just uh, allude to it. Um, so yeah, if at all possible, play note for note because that's what people are. People in a pub where they come to see you, you know, that's what they want to hear. They like the song, they want to hear that. And it's, the bass line is there for a reason. But you know, don't beat yourself up. You can't, there's lots of bass lines I just can't get. You know, I was playing Sir Duke. Um, that little bass run, I can't get that. You know, I can play it, but I can't play it in time. So there's no point in playing it. So just play half of it, and then it makes it sound as if I'm playing along, but I'm not mucking the band up. So, um, you know, be aware of your own limitations and don't be embarrassed by them. We don't all play the same. Because people can play, I can play things that people can play and they can play things that I can't play. And I think they know that what Keith, what Keith Moon said when he was asked, are you the best you know, rock drummer in the world? And he said, I'm the best Keith Moon style drummer in the world. And I think that's so how you should treat the bass as well, you know. Play your strengths, but uh, yes. But if there's another one bites the dust, then you can't really, Go with anything else, can you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Dave. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, buddy. Jim, the same question to you, mate. Well, if you go back to my roots, which would have been classical music, Beethoven and Mozart and all these folk sat down for hours labouring over this piece of music and getting every melody perfect mm -hmm. and then getting every harmony perfect and every bass line perfect, and all the counter melodies perfect, and in the symphony, make sure that the four parts of the symphony all match, and the third dance section was a good dance tune, you know, and it finished in a up upbeat fourth uh, section of the symphony. So these guys really slaved over it, and my contention would be, some orchestras, some musicians you'll listen to, and all you hear is this very mechanical clod, thump, clod, thump, clod, thump, as per the notes. It's very precise. They, they, they know their quavers from their semi-quavers. They can count it, and it's, they're, they're perfect. But there's no damn soul about it, you know. And yet you get some people who can play the exact same piece, and you go, well, you're so emotionally moved because there's so much emotion in the piece. So for myself, I agree with what Dave's saying 110%. Uh, 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 there are certain songs which have a, a distinct bass line, uh, like so, um, 
the Nazareth song, Son of a Bitch, Hair of the Dog, whichever title you're going to give it, without that bass line, it just doesn't sound like the song. You know, you, you really need that in place. So I think as long, for me personally, as long as you've got the essentials in place, such as any riffs that are outstandingly part of the song, and as Dave says, you're, you're keeping the rhythm, you're, you're working within the structure of the harmony and providing the bass line for it, I, I feel that you're doing the job you're meant to be doing. Um, but again, I used to get really fed up at going out to see bands who were either an originals band that thought they were the next Zeppelin or uh, the next Rainbow or the next Oasis or the next big thing. And they were so up their own arses, they couldn't see they were crap. You know, and it's like, oh, I've spent all this money coming out to watch this band and buy a pint or two in the good old days when you could have a pint or two and drive, you know, and I've come and wasted my time. But the other thing on the other side of the coin that really used to piss me off was going in and hearing a covers band play these note for note perfect songs with no damn soul. And I thought, I didn't need to come out the house. I could have sat home and listened to CDs or watched videos or DVDs with the real band playing it and enjoyed it. But I've come out here and all I've heard is basically a bloody CD, pardon the French, and I've spent good money and time coming out for that. <laughs> I would prefer to see a band putting their own tuppence worth in. Now, even if they this, this screw up or do it badly, bless them for trying. It's a bit more interesting than going and saying, I could have listened to the CD at home when they come out here. You know, it's just a personal thing. I mean, maybe some folk are of the opinion that, well, I want to hear it played note perfect and blah, blah, blah. But I think it's more exciting for the audience. And at the end of the day, it's the audience that matters most. Are we shitting on the audience for being so divish that we are so perfect that we can do no wrong? Or are we just giving them, you know, uh, trotting off something? I mean, it does take a lot of effort to put your own self into it, I feel. And I like to, I've seen Dave playing often enough and you sort of think, now there's a bass player that's got passion for his playing and he's putting something in there. There's a passion there and it comes through. And that excites me. And I would spend good money to go and see a band in any part of the country on that basis. But as I say, if it's just a note for note covers trip, uh, the worst offenders are these guys with backing tracks that you get in the working men's clubs. Yeah. But honestly, it's like, oh, everything is just so perfect in a bubble. You know, sweat man, make a bum note now and then, miss a beat now and then, make a grimace as you see your son. To me, it is life and it, it, it's enjoyable and a bit more enjoyable than listening to a CD if you listen to at home. I know if to pay three or four quid for a pint or 10 or 15 quid for petrol to get there. So that's my wee piece. Hopefully it's, <laughs> it's of oh, comic thanks. value for something else. <laughs> thanks, thanks guys. Brilliant. Uh, next question, right? I think guitar players spend a fortune on affectionates. You know, lots of boxes, fuzz pedals, choruses, you know, up the list, a long list there, right? But as bass players, one, do you guys use effects for your bass playing? And do you think it's important to have bass effects? Dave, left to the dealer. <laughs> Want me again? <laughs> yes, left to the dealer. That's it. We are playing poker tonight. <laughs> right. Um, is it is it important? No. It's um. There's some pedals which I wouldn't do without. Um, I'll give you a little, you know, I'll give you a bit of background. Um, you know, I I used to have a multi effects pedal because quite often the, the the main band I play in is is a covers band, and a lot of the covers, harping back to the last. The last question, you know, there are if, if you want to play a sweet child of mine and the little bass run that comes in, Duff McKagan's, he's renowned for using chorus, so mm -hmm. it's not going to sound the same. You want to really give it that feel, it's, you, you need a chorus pedal. But I didn't use them often. Um, but what I did find was, and I love multi effects pedals because they're small, fit in your gig bag, you know, and they do the thing, and you can set them all up to individual, you know, your individual. I used the zoom pedal and it was you know, you have different songs, etc. The reason I gave I stopped doing that is because sometimes during the set, somebody would shout so call it a song because it's going down well, we'll like, put this one in now. I end up dancing on this pedal. And the band would start and I'd be somewhere without a sound or or, or you know, using some squelchy squat, you know, Bootsy Collins type squawk in the middle of a ballad. 
So it was really difficult. So I actually got rid of the, the multi effects pedal. And I've actually got, and I'll, I'll, I'll admit to this, so I, I came prepared. Yeah. That is one of my, that's one of my pedal, my, my uh, effects pedal oh. now. And I've also oh, got an, ext sorry. an extension, an extension pedal with, with a few on it as well. Yeah. And I find that I use them more often than not. It's the occasional song that needs it. Um, and I can just stamp on the effect. And I can turn it on and turn it off in an instant. So it is, it is useful to have. On here are the two pedals which I'll always have. The tuner, absolutely, you, you, know, you need a tuner. And I don't like the ones in the peg heads because they're just not reliable enough. And a compressor. So definitely, I would never play without a compressor. Um, partly because I'm not that good. You know, and, and a compressor will even out the dynamics. And none of us have got the hands of a surgeon. You know, so we can't play perfect every time. So, you know, a space of a slap as well, takes the peaks and troughs out and keeps it a nice, even, even tempo, especially if we have three peaks. But those two, absolutely, I would always, even at the multi effects pedal. I'm sorry, I'm busy. I'm busy, this is for YouTube. Sorry guys, time out just for two seconds, guys, sorry. It's just my brother, he comes in to wait up here, right? Thanks, Steve. Right, if your at compression pedal, sorry. Yeah, so compression, so tuner compression pedal, so that, that's the other two things you can, you can do with that. Even at the multi effects pedal, I still had my big compression pedal. Ah, uh, you were talking there. about doing slap where it evens out the troughs and the peaks. Yeah, just, just anything, you, you can press it down. So say if you imagine something on a scale of, of one to 10, and uh -huh. that's your normal playing style without any effects, and you get really loud and really low, this would take it down, eventually dial it into maybe it's, it'll take it between two and eight. So the dynamic range is much better, so you don't get these. If you do accidentally your finger trips, you hit it too hard, it's not going to come through. So it's a really useful thing to have. And also it gives you sustain, and you can dial in a lot of tone with it. So those are the two main ones I would always have. The rest really are just for the originals band. Sometimes you need something just to, to fill a song out. And it's good is that, to have it. Is that distortion fuzz pedals? Or? This one here is a sub and up. So that's an octave down, octave up. Uh -huh. Which you can do for, you know, give you a really sort of synth effect on that one. Uh -huh. um, that's a chorus pedal. Nice. With a flanger. The only reason the flanger's on there is because um, when, when we play um, Dancing in the Moonlight with Thin Lizzy, uh -huh. it's a very yeah. distinctive bass line and distinctive sound. Although I think he used a phaser, not a flanger, but I've got a flanger. So these are just useful to have occasionally. The other ones here on this one, uh -huh. there is um, the um, echo, the echo and um, reverb. Reverb pedal, distortion pedal, I hate distorted bass, but sometimes, and a, and a delay pedal. And they're just for you know, occasionally, you, you, I'll use them, but um, they come out, they travel with me. I will often do for playing a pub gig on this little pedal board on my, my tuner, compressor, and my, my, my play flanger, because that's all I need. Oh, yeah. Um, so so that's, that's pretty much it. So they are useful to have, they're fun to play with. If you're writing a song, it can definitely, definitely add something to it. If you've got the, the, you know, the, the sub octave down, if you're playing a really such 70s funk bass, right in the middle of the net, you can get the octave down and it gives you a really, you know, a three piece band that will fill out. So they're not essential, the two of them I think are essential, a tuner and a, and a compressor for a bass player, absolute essentials. Yes, they're fun to use, but I could live without them. Brilliant, Dave. Thanks, man. Jim, over to you, buddy. Same question. Ah, ha ha. I'm a moody bugger. <laughs> I definitely agree with Dave on the tuner. Um, it's handy. It's handy because if you're in an environment that's noisy, at least an electronic tuner, you can check your tuning and keep things in tune. Um, but as for effects pedals, I'm a funny one because I go through phases and then I'll complicate but more by saying, well, it depends what I'm trying to do. But I'll be honest, my favourite with a bass is just working off the amp. As I say, have a tuner just so you can keep a note on the tuner, make sure it's okay, and just basically pump it through a decent bass amp. Um, I just, I've got a couple of effects pedals there that I can swap over between guitar and bass on. And they work both perfectly well. And I've got a multi-effects there for bass. 
But to be honest, it, it takes so much fiddling about to set them up, I can't even be arsed. <laughs> so my philosophy is basically, I'm there to make a bass sound, keep the rhythm, work between the drummer and the, 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 the harmony section. So my thing is, keep it simple, keep it fairly clean, try and get a decent sound. And my sort of recommendation for me personally is a basic amp with like volume, bass, treble, and maybe some sort of mid boost. But you go into some rehearsal rooms and there's a bass amp there and it's got a graphic equalizer. It's got built-in <laughs> compression. It's yeah. got all these other knobs and things. And you're thinking, does this make bacon rolls for crying out loud? Come on, you make me a bacon roll, man. Come on. Um, but as I say, I like a, for bass, I, I like a simple bass amp. As I say, with a good sound to it, something like an Ampeg, a Hard K, a Galeon, TCL, something with a good basic setup, something you can get a good sound fairly quickly and easily and maintain. That's the other thing is, you know, if anything gets knocked, at all, you don't want to be searching for that sound again, just a good basic sound. Um, and that's basically me, just a good old boy, keeping it simple boy, keeping it real boy. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> but, I've no but I've no problem with X pedals. I mean, I love Bootsy Coms, I was listening to them the other night there, and there's like a flange there with a digital delay, and I don't know what else was in there. But it's amazing, you know, and it's a good sound and it works for him. So I suppose if I was maybe doing funk and wanted to do like a Bootsy Collins ripoff, yeah, I'd pull the FX pedals out. But as I say, for me, for what I'm doing at the moment, what I've been doing, for me, just that's a good bass sound for a bass amp, and that's my sort of story there. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. That's two different approaches. Great. Thanks. I rest my case. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Thanks. Now, the third question. <laughs> okay. I think, uh, uh, Dave, you're talking about compression pedals, right? We have sound at one and the sound at ten, right? And when it comes to gear, okay, you can pay a low price in custom shop places, eh, you know? So my question is, right, to both you guys, how important is gear, right? For somebody who is beginning, or to someone who's been playing for well and likes to practice a lot, or even to a guy who does gigs, eh, gigs, eh, gigs and loads of shows and stuff, do you guys think there's a one size that fits all? Or do you think, uh, how important is gear for different players? Or could you, is it a one size fits all? I don't know if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I think, no, how important yeah. is having the best gear, but can you do well with low budget gear? Maybe there's a room from discussion there. Maybe. Dave. Not me again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, answer, guys, the answer is, <laughs> gear matters it, it definitely definitely matters but it's it matters you have to feel comfortable with your instrument mm. so the best that the best piece of that you will have is the one that feels good in your hands um and once you've found that base and really to move on you can customize bases you do all sorts you can put in your pickups a lot of people do these kind of things with different bridges you know so it's important that you i've got lots of bases um, that's because I like basses. They're works of art. They're absolutely phenomenal. And they do come, you know, you do get what you pay for. Um, there's no doubt about that. And there's there's reason. I've got these four lined up here, which I prepared earlier. That one there, that's, oh, that one there. That's £125. That was £250. That was £500. And that one's, well, that's £1,200. So four basses. And, I, and, I, and I, I use them all, and they'll all be useful. If, um, and I'll, I'll, bring this, I'll, bring, I'll bring them down. This one here is as light as a feather. Absolutely feather light. So if you're, if you're small, you're young, you're 12, 13 years old, awesome. Great base to start with. Um, does the job. It's, um, problem is, you know, you, it might be sharp and fretting. It's, you know, it's... When you buy a cheap base, if these fret ends are sharp, what, what you're saving money on is a fit and finish. But you're, you know, this has been machine made. Not a human's really touched it. So these are all sharp. You know, and they start playing it, you're all dead enthusiastic, you're young. They play it, it's damned uncomfortable. 
or the action, the strings of the board are, are way up like this, like a, you know, you know, you're pressing a half an inch, and that's uncomfortable. So this base makes a noise, it does what it's supposed to do, it's reasonably well made, it's as light as a feather, so it doesn't have much tone on it, but it, it does the job. So if you get a cheap base, you know, it's, it's okay, you know, to start with a cheap base. The most important thing is spend the money to get it set up properly. Once the base, if the base is comfortable to play, it'll be a joy. And that's the most important thing when you're starting off. Just up here. Is our Ibanez, and it's absolutely, absolutely cracking base. Back to electronics, but you maybe not see that, but where the pocket goes in, see there, see the gap? You know, that's going to take the tone away. It's little things like that. So I'm paying, you're paying more for this base because it's active electronics in it, but it lets it down compared to the cheaper one because it's just not as well put together. But it's a lovely base and it does gig and they got away with and it's a, it's a popular body, so it's light, but it doesn't have much tone to it. There's no depth to the tone. This one here is 500 quid. That's my that's my gigging base. That's the one. I, that's my go-to base. It's active. It's five hundred pounds. Is that the one? Is that the one that you practice on as well? Do you practice on that one and gig with it? Is that your main yeah. practice base? This is my pickup base. This is my go-to girl. She's uh. And this one here. What you're paying for here is look at the woods. Look at the neck pocket. Look at this. You couldn't. You, you couldn't fit up. You know. Is a, you could put anything in, in, in that neck pocket. It's got a zero fret on it. This is wonderful for in the studio. It's a great because it sounds good and it's got a very low output pickup. So therefore it's not good playing live, but in the studio it's absolutely fantastic. So horses for courses. So that's why I've got these four. But why do you play this one? Because if I'm playing in a pub, I'm not going to take that one. You know, if it gets if it gets knocked over. So 500 pounds, you think, well, it's, it's robust, it's strong. So the most important thing to do is, does it feel comfortable? I like a 12 inch radius on the neck. You know, I like the 17 millimeter string spacing. I like active electronics because I play in a covers band. I've got to emulate a lot of different bass players. Mm. This is it. And that's the one I'll pick up in practice because that's the one I use most. So yeah, gear matters and it matters, you know, for all these different reasons. You know, I would I would play big with that one because but the pickups are just too strong on it. And there's no, it, it, over, it overrides the tone. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why you get a base. If you want to go gigging with a 1200 claim base in, the, in a pub in the middle of Edinburgh on a Saturday night, they'll mend you. <laughs> that is, that's solid. The neck is thick on the light because if it falls over, it's not going to damage itself. It's not that, you know, that's a, that's a sports car. You know, it's, it'll just, it's, it's fickle. That one. So you want something that's reliable, solid, and most importantly, feels comfortable, and uh, and is set up properly. It should be a joy in your hands to play. You, you want to pick up, you want to play, etc. If you're not gigging, then it doesn't really matter. That little thing is absolutely fantastic. I've got piccolo strings on at the moment, so I want to learn how to play piccolo bass properly. So I'm not going to put piccolo strings and buy a 700 pound bass to do that. I want the cheapest bass possible because I just want to practice on it. Um, so you do get what you pay for, um, but just because something's expensive, I choose I, I choose her any day, you know, to, to go out and to go out and get. But that one in the studio simply because it just it has a sound. It's, it's designed for that environment. Brilliant, Dave. Thanks, man. As I say, I, I one more thing. See with this. <clears throat> you mentioned Ampeg Zeller, Jim. This is I use a Mark Bass so little thing like this. That's it. 350 watts, it's powerful enough. I don't like the sound of Mark bass, I like an Ampeg, but I can pick that up, I can put my that bass in the gig bag, you know, with a compressor pedal, um, and carry my amp on the bus. That's the reason I have that 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 um that kit. So and that, and that, so my advice to anyone is go into a guitar store, the, the guitar store obviously once the lockdown is over, and and pick up as many bass as you can, see which 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 feels comfortable to you. You know, and work out why it feels comfortable. Is it the is it the radius of the neck? Is it is it the scale length of the thing? Is it the, is it the finger spacing? Is it the weight? What is it that makes that basically feel comfortable? And then, 
you know, and they look for something that, that has those specifications and the price you can afford. Dave, uh, that Mark Bay Sam you just pulled up there, do you take that to rehearsals? And if you do, can you hear it over our live drum kit? Yes, yes, no problem with that. So you take it to rehearsals? I take it to rehearsals. As Jim said, you go, you go to rehearsal rooms and there's all sorts of different amps giving you different sounds. You want the band to sound like it's going to sound when it's on the stage. That's so therefore, there's no point in playing with a different app which has got a different set of dynamics on it. So I've got that one which I can easily take around with me. So the sound to get in the practice room is a sound I'm going to get on the stage. And that particular one actually has a line out. So if I'm playing on a big stage, you can take the line out to the sound guy. And on stage, I've got my, you know, I can dial in the sound and he can play with it. So, so yeah, it, it does matter. But, you know, if you've got a budget, don't just look for what, what you can get for that budget. Go and try the things, see what fits, why does it fit, what's about that particular bass that, that feels right for you. Um, and then go and look for one, even second hand, as long as you've got the specifications, it should be okay for you. That's great to you. Thanks, man. Thank you. Jim, I'm going to ask you the same question. Do you know <laughs> what the question is? I can repeat it if you want. <laughs> it's about gear. Yeah. Uh, how important is having good gear for practicing or learning or gigging? What's your thoughts on having gear? Well, basically the same what they have said. I, I agree with a lot of what Dave's saying. I couldn't start a fight in a car park with him over anything they say. <laughs> I think for me personally, it boils down to who you are and where you're at. Now, I've got this unique view, I think, but I don't know, maybe others are gay. I didn't go into a guitar shop and see all these guitars that have come at the factory, you know, exactly the same. I look at these guitars as all having their own personality. So, for example, you get two precision bases on the wall. I could pick one up and say, nah, I hate it. I could pick the other one up, same color, same factory, same manufacturer run, and absolutely love it, you know. So what Dave's saying about picking an instrument up and playing it and feeling comfortable with it, that is what I would endorse as a comfort zone. I mean, look, I've had folks say to me in the past, how much would you spend on this or spend on that? And my thing as well, it's down to who you are, where you're at, and, and what you can afford. I mean, who the hell wants to go and spend 2,400 quid on a Rickenbacker bass? Now, I'd love to have a Rickenbacker bass, to be honest. But who wants to spend two and a half grand almost on a Rickenbacker bass if it's just going to hang on a wall? Or you're going to take it out to a pub and somebody's going to bash into you and you end up in a wall with the neck broken? You know, um, I reckon back a bass would be great if you were in, say, a touring band like, we'll say, a Motorhead or a Guns N' Roses, you know, and you were up there on stage and you've got roadies looking after the thing and caring for it, and you don't need to worry about that. I would say that's fine. If you can afford that gear for that style of playing at that level, pay what the hell you want, you know, get customised, what have you. But if a Dave says you're just playing an Edinburgh or a Glasgow boozer on a Friday or Saturday night, <laughs> get one at a second-hand shop for 50 quid if you can. <laughs> because once you pump it through an amp, who the hell's going to notice the difference when they're half drunk? <laughs> and don't death to, to boot. But as I say, I, I, I'm an awkward one. I couldn't say, here's a budget, what have you? I would say it's down to what you perceive as being good value and what you want. I mean, when I was younger, a lot of guys had to get a, an SG because Angus Young had an SG and uh, others would want a, a strap because Richard Blackmore had it and all that sort of thing. Uh, whatever cranks your handle, you know, if, if you like the look of the guitar, the, the, the bass of the guitar, if it feels good and it's playable, that's fine. That, to me, is you've, you've struck what you're looking for. But if you want to progress, as Dave's saying, you may have to get improved pickups because some pickups will be too powerful, some will be underpowered for what you're doing, uh, some necks that are easier, like I've got an Ebony bass, and it's got a great neck, very fast on it. Just a cheap thing that I got as a thief's bargain. Very fast neck, but when I go to my more expensive Westone, it's a different baby to play with, you know. So as I say, 
different necks, different setups can bring out certain things and what have you. So I would say, as I say, I'll, I'll be difficult and say it's down to you, uh, it's down to what you can afford. And what I would say is buy the best you can. But we are quick analogy, what I would say is when I was buying tools when I was in the trade, what I would do is go to somewhere that had a good selection. So say I was going in for laying on folk for fast term. I'd go in, I'd have a look at what they had, and quite often I'd do is mentally discount the cheapest ones. But then I'd discount the dearest ones and I'd look in the middle. <coughs> that way, try them for weight and comfort and what have you. And then I'd find the one I wanted, and that was me. And as I say, with the guitars and the basses, I'd say it's pretty much the same thing. Something you're comfortable with. Then you go over the score because it keeps up with the, the Steve Vai's and the Satriani's or whoever your heroes are. But at another extreme, then you go and just buy the cheapest tack you can get. Get something that you can afford, that's reasonable, that you've sort of got an, uh, an attachment to. And at the end of the day, my attitude has always been a good player that will play anything and still get a good sound out of it. So then you put yourself down because, oh, I'm in this band and I've got a Nibbany bass and all these guys have got Gibsons and Ludwig drums, I'm the poor kid. Then you think that way. You're as good as these guys. You're playing an important role. It's what you put in, put out at the end of the day that will count. No whether your guitar costs 100 quid or a 1,000. But there's a lot of good practical stuff in what Dave said. Then you take your, 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 your babies uh, on a Friday or Saturday night. Take the, <laughs> take the one you learn on. That, that, that's not too bad if it gets damaged. So hopefully that's something there. <laughs> and thanks, Tim. Guys, listen, thank you. I only have about five minutes left in the Zoom meeting. So if I was to end this meeting and invite you back in about five minutes with some bonus questions, would you guys have time for that? Yes, absolutely. Great, yeah. guys. I'll yeah. see you in five minutes then. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Much love, guys. Welcome back to the bonus round. All the bonus questions there. Um, guys, uh, I think guitar players got obsessed with wood. You know, they got obsessed with the wood of the body and the neck and maple and rosewood and stuff and so on. In terms of bass guitar, how important, or do you think that tone would exist? Do you think the actual material of the wood affects the tone? Dave, left to the dealer. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get lynched on the internet for this one, aren't I? The, the tone would debate, I thought we put it to the side. <laughs> yes, yes, it does matter. In, in my experience, it does matter. Not massively. I mean, you know, the tone wood debate really came out of acoustic, uh, you know, acoustic guitars. And yes, the resonance of wood, etc. But in an in a, in electric bass, especially, it's a big long piece of metal waggling over a magnet, inducting an electric field, you know, an electric current. You know, but so theoretically, no, you got a plank, you know, you know um, like a Les Paul's original plank of wood over a pickup, and you think it's not going to make a difference. But the, it does make a subtle difference. You know, the density of the wood. Mm -hmm. Definitely made a subtle difference, not massively, but definitely subtle. And it's, not, it's something that I've noticed in my main bases that I play. Here's these, these two there. They're both mahogany, you know, and I've always erred towards and gone towards mahogany bases because they've got a really nice mid range. Um, because when when the string vibrates, that there will be sympathetic vibrations coming back along the strings that will give it a certain flavour. And 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 the uh, and the um, clarity is there. A lot of people say well, swamp ash will be will be yeah brighter, and the mahogany will be duller. But it is duller. But I like the mid. I just like the feel. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, fundamentally, I, I do think it exists, but it's it's a small small component. As I showed you on the on, on the Ibanez earlier, the neck pocket's not tight, so you're losing a lot of vibration, etc., and resonance on that. So it could be all of the fit and finish, etc. But the most important thing, I mean, I also like a mahogany because it's reasonably light. I don't know if it's heavy, but I've been a reason, you know, it's not too much of a heavy wood, but swamp ash, it is denser, so it's heavier, and it does have a different sound. So it must exist, but it's not the big be all and end all that, that you know, people get their, get their, their, their panties in a twist for. Um, but yes, certainly on a, you know, on, and people say, what, a rosewood fingerboard, a maple fingerboard, is there a difference? Well, I think there is. Mm. 
it's absolutely so. I, I have to play two bases simultaneously beside. Did it? If somebody, I would guess a band if somebody was on the stage with a, I, I don't know, a, um, you know, a, a maple, a maple neck bass with a with a basswood body. I don't think I'd, I'd notice it. I'd know it was any different to what it's supposed to be. You know, in that respect. But so it does, and it's fun. But I do. There's something about the tone of mahogany that I really enjoy. So obviously, yeah. Right, man. So yeah, sure. Technically, I should say question, but the tone wood does exist. And what's your thoughts on it? Well, I mean, the thing is, and you've got a, a, a plucked string. Um, we work for 440. Uh, is it hertz? Kilohertz? Millihertz? I forget. But that's your E, and if you go to E T T, you get an octave higher, and so on and so forth. So, on the basic laws of physics, if you've got a denser, heavier wood, the characteristics of that carrying a frequency is it's going to be different from a, a lighter wood. Now, at the end of the day, I reckon there is something on the side. Pardon me, as Dave's saying on the, the tone we debate. But the thing is, you can go and fiddle all you want, with all the woods you want, the combinations you would do on, and what have you, and get the best pickups in the world, then stick it through a shitty amp and it sounds like everybody else. So, as Dave said, in a live playing situation, well, does it make a heck of difference? I mean, you as a tradesman might feel better because you've got a mahogany body and what have you, uh, and a, a nice warm rosewood neck, you know. But at the end of the day, as I say, it's maybe something for your own benefit, but does the audience hear any difference? Um, it's, it's, as I say, it's a certain once you bang it through an amplifier and start putting these knobs, straight away you're, you're redefining the whole initial frequency. I mean, if you've got a pre-gain on an amp, you're going to be working on what's actually coming to the amp for the, 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 the base. But on your post-gain, you're going to set your final volume. So, as I say, the minute you start twiddling with these damn knobs, all you've had, all this perfection, has gone out the window. So I don't know too much about it. I'd say it's an interesting debate. Uh, let every man be persuaded in his own mind. At the end of the day, I would not want to argue with somebody and fork with them over no. the, the wood to me. <laughs> it's been done. Interesting, can I just see what Jim said? You mentioned amps earlier on and the simplicity of amps. I would love if an amp, a company came out with an amp that just had a volume button on it mm -hmm. and nothing more. And you just use your bass to fine tune the sound you want. You know, yeah. so I've got. All sorts of things to, cut, to to shape my bass, and then things to shape on my amp, and then you know, just like, you know, if if you just get amp and say I want it that loud, and you shape your tone on your bass, why am I keep it with that being wrong? That's, that's an idea, certainly. That's, uh... Right, guys, last bonus question for tonight: um, tips for auditioning. So, Dave, you're going to audition for a band, say in seven weeks' time. What's your top tips for an uh, audition for a band, Dave? My right, top tips are, first of all, do, do you really want to play in that band? Because there's a lot of times you think you're between bands or you, want to think, you think it's a good idea or it's a gig, etc. But you think, well, is it going to be fun? You know, first of all, you know, it's okay to say, you know, I don't really want that gig because humans being humans, you know, we'll go along and we just won't care and we'll try our best and we get in we get in if we don't get in, get in we don't get in so yeah, there's no point if you're going to make the effort to say is, is that what I want to play secondly just ask make sure that your expectation what, ask the band what is it what do you want me to play what's the set list and even if it's originals right send me some recordings you know and learn the parts just learn the parts and I don't mean sit down and start learning the parts put the, put the songs on get get to feel the songs the more you know the song, if you totally muck up your part and you, you've got the vibe and the groove of the song going, you can you can wing that and put you know a little bit of yourself into it. Uh, you know, so if you can't get it as earlier on, you're playing note for note. You know, if, you, if there's bits that you can't play of the original, then don't play it. Put something else in. But give yourself plenty of time. Don't cram it. Don't start to to learn the bass things too quick, and don't leave it to last minute. Learn 
listen to songs, be comfortable with the songs, make sure you've got the songs and make sure that that's what they're expecting you to do. You know, and if it gets to the audition and, and somebody asks you to do something you're not prepared for, then just say, well, you didn't ask me to do that. You know, just, you know, rather than put yourself in a position where you think you might wing it and you make a week, you know, big breakfast of it and it's not going to help you at all. But really, that's it. And don't, you know, don't, you won't be nervous, really, you won't be nervous if you've done your prep and you've, and you've done your background, etc. cetera. Um, you know, <laughs> Just make sure you've got, make sure you bring a cable. <laughs> I've known people have gone on an audition without any cables. <laughs> I didn't go down very well. But yeah, make, make, make sure, you, make sure your, your, your bass is up to spec. You, you, know, you, you know the songs, you're happy with the songs, you enjoy playing the songs. You want to play that kind of music. Um, and, you know, and, and treat it as a bit of fun. Smile. Be nice, be easy to work with. Right, that's another thing. Go and smile. Don't be the diva. Don't say, oh, I need this, I need that, and, and start calling people out, etc. Um, you know, these guys are bringing in, and they want to know that you're, you're going to turn up on time. The bass player that turns up on time and plays root notes is going to get the gig over the guy who can play all oh, everything fancy, fancy, when it's, you know, even when he's not supposed to. But he you know, turns up 10 minutes late for rehearsal every time, you know, and uh, comes up five minutes before the gig and doesn't help with the load in and load out. So, you know, you've got to be... Be yourself, be willing to, to be part of the band and not stand apart. I think that's pretty much it. Thanks, Dave. Just to pick up on something there, you said that okay, you've been in the past where people have turned up with no cables. But well, one time I was in a blues band and a drummer turned up who never had sticks, right? But then he'd ask me to find them a set of sticks. Like I was going to tap on people's doors and ask if it was a set of sticks. Eh? But anyway, Jim. <laughs> anyway, um, what's the question again? Uh, oh, tips for auditioning. You are going to audition mm -hmm. in seven weeks' time, and it's a band that you you really want to join. So, what's your thought process? What's the tips you would give someone, and what process would you do yourself, buddy? Well, I think basically. Um, I've been at both sides of the coin, so I think I can give this advice. Think through basically what you're going to be doing, and then think through, and I think it's fairly close to what Dave's saying, think through what the band's looking for. So if you're fairly young in the faith and not been playing for too long and you've learned a few songs, what have you, if it's a band the other youngsters, even if they're in their 60s, <laughs> think about where they're at, or find out, try and find out where they're at. Are they, are they new band, are they new players, are they seasoned players? Uh, I mean, if you've only been playing for six months, you're going to be incredibly brave going in beside guys that have been playing for 40 or 50 years. Now, after saying that, my experience is a lot of guys and that's been playing for 40, 50, 60 years, are going to be very, um, they've seen it all, they've done it all, and they're going to be very welcoming, and they'll be very forgiving, you know, as opposed to these 16-year-old, 14 to 16-year-old youngsters that's going to be the next big thing and change the world, that are going to be hyped up and, oh, no, you're crap, man, get out of here, you know. You, you'll probably find older, more seasoned players are a lot more reasonable to work with than some of the younger ones that are set up coming up starts <laughs> so as i say try and find out what you can you know what are the songs you want me to play on the day um are the the, the standard covers uh, are the covers that you do your own take on like instead of playing mustang sally as a sort of soul come r and b song do you play it as speed metal i mean what are you doing with these songs that can come and prepare and whether it's an originals band or, or, or as Dave's saying, or a, a covers band, give anything I can listen to, to hear these songs so that you play them so I can tune in. So as I say, try and think through who you're at, where you're at, what you're looking for, what you're looking for in this band. Is it a first band? Is it a second band? Are you wanting to expand? You know, uh, suppose you've done um, classic pop rock covers and you want to try your hand at country and you've done a course at country, bass, you know, is it your first bass, uh, bass gig on a, a country band? 
song. You know, as I say, think it through, get as much information you can about the songs that are played, make sure you've got the keys right, because it can be a bit of a bugger trying to transpose a song on the night, on the moment. It's uh, sometimes not too bad, other times it can be quite difficult. Um, as I say, find it as much as you can and prepare as much as you can. Now, I've noticed over the years, if you used to go to an audition or somebody turned up to an audition and they'd learnt the three or four songs. Over the years, what I've noticed is a, a lot of people turning up and they slap this big folder out in front of themselves and a music stand or the sticker, tablet or a device on the, the, a mic stand and the stand following that. You know, it's not very impressive because my question is, you're at a gig and somebody's stolen your sheets or your device is broken down or there's no Wi-Fi to run it off, uh, what have you, or you've been blinded with acid, are you still going to play the gig when you're relying on these things? That's what I would be thinking of as somebody that's going to boot, bring somebody into a band. You know, <laughs> what are they going to be like? when the chips are down and all these tools and the, I've none against these tools and resources, but the thing is, what are they going to be like if those things ain't there? Will they still be able to play? And, you know, if I would say the big thing is learn the songs, learn them well, and go out to will them with them. You know, you might make a few mistakes, as Dave says, but if you go out and have the right attitude and you want to get on with it and, you know, put something into it, put a bit of welly behind it, you know, folk will warm to that rather than somebody that's cold and detached and not really interested, they're that good, they can play without anything, or you're peering at your stuff. Uh, I mean, once we auditioned a guy and he had a six-string bass and he had every blasted note on good old fashioned tab, uh, no tab, um, like bass clef. Mm -hmm. And he could read it. Wow, wow. And at the end of the, at the end of one of the songs, he says, uh, You only played the bridge section twice. Uh, no, no, no. He says, You played the bridge section thrice. It's only twice. Uh, but that's how we play it. <laughs> And he went and dug out this cassette machine, because it was cassette machine's yeah. name, and he played this jumping jack flash and proved to us that they only played this part of the bridge twice. And my mate just goes, we motherfucking well play it thrice. If you don't like it, there's the door, you know. So I think at the end of the day, you didn't want to come in hard and fast and tied to, it has to be this way. Be open to the guys you're going to work with. And at the end of the day, it's not so just a, a, a case you come into, well, we're doing your bass playing. It's a case you come into a team, an established team, and working with them. So you've got to bring value to that. You've got to bring something to it. You've got to bring harmony. And the last thing guys is want is, is you at the end of every song saying, that should be twice, that should be thrice, that intro is too long, you play it too fast. I mean, I, I, I know that long ago I had somebody saying something about uh, a song and they said, oh, the fault with every band that plays that song uh, is that they play it too fast. And it's like, well, how fast? Uh, they play it too fast. You know, if that's a folk are playing it and folk are enjoying it, so what? You know, but as I say, if you come into a situation where folk are there, Remember, it's their band, and if you're an asshole and piss them off, they'll just say bye-bye. They're looking for somebody that is going to work with them, be a team player, and hopefully shine, and bring great glory to the band. That's my wee bit. <laughs> guys, Tim, thanks, man. Brilliant, guys. Listen, fabulous. Guys, listen. Thank you. <laughs> really Thank great. You. That was fun. Tonight, man. Thanks, man. Guys, uh, and have fun at the auditions. Sorry? And have fun at the auditions. I missed that bit out. Having fun too. All right. right. Listen, I will thank you for tonight. And I'll see you both again very, very soon. <laughs> and I'll Look have a, some more. Good. I'll have a, a, a wee thank you some more questions. This time I'll take some more Sorry? You can go first next time. Right, Jim has to be up to my left. <laughs> no worries. So Here's a question. Here's a question. When they play in a band, do we have to pay for the hookups? Or do we get them free? Well, if the drugs are free, they should be free. 
É isso aí, é isso aí. É isso aí, Camino. Fica aí, vou ter que ir. Fica aí, vou ter que ir. Fica aí, vou ter que ir.